For it is as if a man, going on a journey, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I've made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy servant. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I know that you were a harsh man reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave! You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the one talent from him, and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. If you turn on your television, and you flick through the channels, it won't be long before you find a talent show. It could be a talent show about dancing, skating, baking. It could be about sewing. And I think there's even one about pottery. They seem all the rage at the moment. The airwaves are full of them. If you read that story that we've just heard, the parable of the talents, you'd think that was an original talent show if you read it at face value. But in Jesus's time, a talent didn't mean a gift or a skill as we use that word today. A talent was a weight of gold or silver. So a talent was actually an amount of money. So the story that Jesus tells us goes like this. A man is about to go on a journey, but before he goes, he decides to call his slaves or servants together and he gives each of them some money, some talents, and then off he disappears. A long time passes and eventually the man, the master returns and he calls all his slaves together. He asks them what they've done with the talents. And the first two slaves show him Whatever they've done with the talents, we're not quite sure, but whatever they've done, they've doubled the amount that the master gave them. They are both congratulated and they are given even more talents and responsibility. And then the third servant or slave appears. You can imagine him as he comes into the room of the master, dusting or cleaning his single talent, which is just uncovered from having been buried in the ground. And the slave makes excuses. The master is angry. He takes that talent from the servant and gives it to one of the other slaves before consigning the worthless slave to the outer darkness. Now, I imagine if you'd pitched that idea for a talent show, to a TV station, I'm sure you wouldn't get a positive response. 
But what has that story of the parable of the talents that Jesus told have to say to us today? I think the key phrase in the story is this, entrusted his property. It comes right at the start of the story in verse 14. It's what the man does to his slaves before he leaves. He entrusts his property. Entrusts implies a relationship between the master on one hand and the servant on the other, because you can't have any trust without a sense of relationship. And then there's the word that Matthew uses for property or possessions. It doesn't just mean material things, the things that you have or the things that you own. It's about one whole being, one's whole life. So in that sense, the master is giving his entire self, if you like, over to his servants or slaves. And he doesn't give them instructions what to do with it. He just leaves. And that is that. The people who first heard Matthew's telling of this parable faced the challenge and the risk of expressing their Christian faith. Would they keep it hidden or would they risk it going public? The latter, which is the action of the first two slaves and the results become an encouragement to those early Christians and they're an encouragement to us too. And then there's that third slave. Compare his view of his master with the first two slaves. The third calls his master harsh, reaping where you do not sow, gathering where you do not scatter seed. What do the other two slaves think of their master? Well, we don't actually know. But I wonder, does the third slave view of the master influence the way that he behaved? Yes, I think it probably does. And following on from that, is the way that we behave, the way that we live out our faith, influenced or coloured by our view of God? Again, whether it's conscious or unconscious, I would say, yes, it probably does. I suppose the question then is, how do you how do I picture God? And what effect does the way that we picture God have on our discipleship, our faith, and the way that we express and witness to that faith? Is your view of God one of a harsh master or a loving, generous father? And what difference does that make to you? There's a wonderful phrase in a set of prayers that were written by the Iona community. And in those prayers, they lift up to God people who have no faith. And the prayer goes, we pray for those who need to forget the God they don't believe in and meet the God who believes in them. Our discipleship is a reflection and a response to our belief and understanding of God. The God of the first two slaves is a God who places his trust in us to the point of placing Jesus in our hands and a God who responds in love and generosity. This is the God I believe in. What about you? Let's pray. You give us so much, Lord, trusting us more than we trust ourselves, blessing us with opportunities that we are slow to take. 
Thank you for believing in us. Help us to believe in ourselves, in one another and in you. And help us to live out that belief this day and this week. Amen.